The second video on complex numbers looks at modulus and argument. So the first video was largely a revision video, making sure students understood the definitions of ij, the fact that bod mass applies, what's an argon diagram, what's a complex conjugate. This video is going to introduce the concept of gain and phase. Now alternatively, some people may use the words modulus and argument, and you need to be flexible. If people say gain, they might say modulus. Some people say phase, others say argument. Now why do we need to know this? Because these properties are very widely used in many engineering scenarios. Some examples, control system analysis, obviously the focus of other videos in this series, electrical circuits, fluid flow, magnetic fields, and so on. So what are the definitions of modulus and argument? Well, the modulus, or gain, of a complex number is the distance from the origin in the argon diagram. Very simple definition. What about the argument or phase? This is the angle between the positive real axis and a line drawn to the complex number in the argon diagram. And you note that anti-clockwise is taken to be a positive angle. That's very important. Now it's easier to demonstrate this with a sketch. <laughs> so here's an example. We've got a complex number here, z equals x plus jy. So the modulus is the distance from the origin. Now in this particular case, you'll see we've said x equals 1 and y equals 2. And therefore, that distance is going to come from the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared, simply Pythagoras. What about the phase? Well, the phase was given as the angle between the positive real axis, there's the positive real axis, and the line drawn to the number. And so you see that's this angle here theta. So in this particular case, you'll see the angle is tan to the minus 1 of 2 over 1. OK, a few more examples for you to try. Find the modulus and argument for the following complex numbers. So the first one, 3 plus 6i, which is at this point here. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw a line from the origin to the complex number, because then I can see what is the length? Well, the length of that line is clearly going to be the square root of 3 squared plus 6 squared. Now, the next thing was, what's the argument? And we said, find the angle between the positive real axis, there it is, and that other line. So there's the angle, theta. And in this case, it's going to be tan to the minus 1 of 6 over 3. Another example then, what about this one, minus 5 plus 2j? So again, first thing to do is draw a line from the origin to that point, and then find the length of that line. Well, in this case, the length is clearly the square root of 5 squared plus 2 squared from Pythagoras. Now, what about the angle? Remember, the angle was taken between this black line and the positive real axis. So it's this angle here, phi. Now, it may not be so easy to do phi direct, but what I can do is I can calculate this little angle in here. OK, so let's call that alpha. Now, fairly clearly, alpha is given as 10 to the minus 1 of 2 over 5. And therefore, phi is going to be minus 180 plus 10 to the minus 1 of 2 over 5. Now, why have I written minus 180? Because you remember, clockwise rotation is interpreted as a negative argument in the complex plane. So this is just a summary of the results from that previous page. OK, some general formula. So if you have a complex number, a plus jb, the modulus is straightforward. You just use Pythagoras. There you are, the square, square root of the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary part. The phase, however, is a bit more tricky. And you need to be careful because you can't just naively put in inverse tan, as you noted on the previous slide. You need to know which quadrant does the complex number lie in. So if I draw my axes there so you can see them, then you see where I've got quadrant 
1 here, quadrant 2 here, quadrant 3 here, and quadrant 4 here. So you need to know which quadrant you're in in order to calculate the phase correctly, otherwise you might make a silly mistake. So here we go. If you're in quadrant 1, then what that's telling you is that A is a positive number, B is a positive number, so you can just use the straightforward formula tan to the minus 1 of B over A. So for example, this distance would be B and this distance would be A. So quadrant 1, everything is simple. What happens if you're in quadrant 2? Well, in quadrant 2, you need to be a little bit careful because while the vertical distance is B, A is actually now a negative number. So if you were to do tan to the minus 1 of B over A, you're getting tan to the minus 1 of a negative number. So in order to make sure we don't make silly mistakes, what I recommend you do is use this formula here. You see, what I've done is I've set it's 180 minus 10 to the minus 1 of B over the modulus of A. So I've ensured that in the 10 to the minus 1 formula, I've used only positive numbers. And then I've used my insight to the picture to make sure I get the right answer. What happens if I'm in quadrant 3? Well, if you're in quadrant 3, now both B and A are negative. OK, and so probably the easiest thing to do is use this formula here, minus 180 plus 10 to the minus 1. And you see, I've put modulus of B over A um, just to make sure I get a positive number. In fact, in this case, because B and A are both negative, that might not be needed. And finally, what if you're in quadrant 4? Well, quadrant 4, B is negative and A is positive. So you'll see I've used this formula here, minus 10 to the minus 1 modulus B over A. And you might be saying, well, why bother with this? If I do 10 to the minus 1 of a negative number, won't it give me an angle between 0 and minus 90? Well, it might, but it might not, because some calculators will give you an inverse tan in quadrant 4, and some calculators will give you inverse tan of a negative number in quadrant 2. And if you're a bit cavalier with your calculators, you could make a silly mistake. So my recommendation is always use formula which give the inverse tan in quadrant 1, and then you will avoid silly mistakes. So find the gain and phase of the following. And key thing is always check the quadrant first by doing a crude sketch. So 2 plus 4j. Well, 2 plus 4j is here. So it's in quadrant 1. So I can do the gain, the modulus of 2 plus 4j. This is simply by Pythagoras. You're going to get the square root of 2 squared plus 4 squared. And the phase of 2 plus 4j is just going to be 10 to the minus 1 of 4 over 2. So that one's relatively straightforward. What about minus 3 plus j? Well, minus 3 plus j is going to be about here. So you can see it's in quadrant 2. So again, the modulus is straightforward. The modulus of minus 3 plus j is just going to be the square root of 3 squared plus 1 squared. But the phase of minus 3 plus j, I'm going to recommend you use 180 minus 10 to the minus 1 of 1 over 3. So I've used my insight into the geometry here to make sure I get the correct answer. What about 2 minus... Oh, sorry, I made a silly mistake there. And these things happen sometimes. I'm going to scrub that previous one out. 2 minus 8j was meant to be down here. And so the phase for that one is going to be minus 10 to the minus 1 of 8 over 2. Apologies for that. And then the final one, minus 4 minus 0.5j is going to be somewhere around here. And so you'll get the argument of minus 4 minus 0.5j is going to be minus 180 plus 10 to the minus 1 of 0.5 over 4. Now, next question. What about the gain and phase of complex conjugates? So a complex conjugate is a complex number with the same real part, but the opposite sign for the imaginary part. 
So here's an example from the first video. Z equals 2 plus 3j, Z bar 2 minus 3j. So I could plot both of these on the argon diagram, and you can see there was Z, and down here was Z bar. Now hopefully it's obvious to you that if the argument of Z is theta, then the argument of Z bar must be minus theta. What if we do a different one? Q equals minus 5 minus 6i. So let's mark that one down. There we go. Minus 5 minus 6i. There's Q. Q bar minus 5 plus 6i up there. And again, if I mark the angles, you'll see you get phi for Q. Then clearly you must get minus phi for Q bar. So the angles are the negative one of another. So it should be obvious that complex conjugates have identical gains. I've not explained that, but hopefully you can see that. And phases of equal magnitude, but opposite signs. So what about the gain of an inverse? So what's the link between the gain of a complex number z and its inverse 1 over z? So let's do a bit of algebra. Let z equal a plus bi. So 1 over z is 1 over a plus bi or ib. And again, as in the first video, I'm going to multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate so I can get rid of the bits that I don't like. So if I do that, you'll see I get 1 over z is this. It's a minus ib over a squared plus b squared. And so the modulus of 1 over z, now using the sum of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared in the square root, see there's the real part squared, there's the imaginary part squared. Now, if I look at this, you'll see the denominators are both a squared plus b squared, but I've got also got an a squared plus b squared up here, so I end up with this. The square 1 over, sorry, the square root of 1 over a squared plus b squared. Now, why is that significant? What you can see is the modulus of 1 over z is the square root of 1 over a squared plus b squared. The modulus of z is the square root of a squared plus b squared. In other words, if you product the modulus of z with the modulus of the inverse, you get 1. The inverse is one of another. And that's probably exactly what you would have expected. The gains are the inverses one of the other. And this is what you'd expect if complex numbers are to obey simple Bodmas rules. What about the phase of the inverse then? So again, this first line is the same as the previous page. I've simply calculated 1 over z and said it can be written like this. a minus ib over a squared plus b squared. And now I'm going to calculate its phase. Using this argument here, the phase is tan to the minus 1 of the imaginary part over the real part. So the phase of z was 10 to the minus 1 of b over a. The phase of 1 over z is going to use this complex number here. And you see you get 10 to the minus 1. And here it is, this yucky expression, minus b over a squared plus b squared over a over a squared plus b squared. And clearly, these cancel. So you get 10 to the minus 1 of minus b over a. And so looking at these two, what do you notice? They're negatives one of the other. So the real and imaginary parts have got the same, and here's the key thing, relative magnitude. You see I've got A plus Bi here, and the real part here, A and the imaginary part B, they've got the same relative magnitude, although not the same actual magnitude. And so the inverse has got the opposite sign in the imaginary part, and therefore the phases must be equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign. So what's the summary? Complex conjugates have got identical gains, phases of equal magnitude, but opposite signs. So there you are. The modulus of z is the same as the modulus of z bar, and the phase of z is minus the phase of z bar. If you look at inverses, they have inverse gains, and also phases of equal magnitude but opposite signs. So you get the modulus of z times the modulus of 1 over z is 1. And the phase of z equals minus the phase of 1 over z. 
And here's the interesting one. You'll notice the phase of the complex conjugate is the same as the phase of the inverse. So, some questions. Find the modulus and argument of the following. OK. 1 plus j modulus. This bit's fairly straightforward. The modulus is going to be the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is the square root of 2. And the phase of 1 plus j is going to be 10 to the minus 1 of 1 over 1. Now, why we've put that one here is you'll see the second one is simply saying, what's the modulus argument of the inverse? And what it's expecting you to do is use the observation that the modulus of z times the modulus of 1 over z is 1. It's expecting you to use this observation. And therefore, the modulus of 1 over 1 plus j is going to be 1 over root 2. And I'm simply using this rule, this observation, from the previous question. I've just inverted the root 2 I got for the first bit. And similarly, we had a rule on the phases. We said if you invert a complex number, you just change the sign of the phase. So the phase of 1 over 1 plus j has got to be minus 10 to the minus 1 of 1 over 1. And you see that's just taken from this result here. OK, I'm not going to dwell on this one because we'll run out of space, but you can do that one by yourself using exactly the same technique. First do minus 1 minus i. And having done that, 1 over minus 1 minus i is done by inspection. But we'll do this one using the same rule. So the modulus of 1 minus j root 3 is given by the square root of 1 squared plus 3, which is 2. And therefore, the modulus of 1 over 1 minus j root 3 must be 1 over 2. Similarly, if we've got the phase of 1 minus j root 3, it's going to be minus 10 to the minus 1 of root 3. Then the phase of 1 over 1 minus j root 3 has got to be plus 10 to the minus 1 of root 3. So you'll see with this latter one, I didn't do any clever algebra. I simply said, I can treat this complex number as if it was in the numerator and then use my rules in order to find the phase. And that's much quicker. Now, just as a summary, in the longer term, when you have a modulus argument data, people will often represent complex numbers in this compact form. So you see 1 plus j had a modulus root 2 and a phase 45 degrees. So I can write it as root 2 arg 45, or if I'm going to use radians, root 2 arg pi by 4. And this is simply a shorthand notation to capture the gain and phase information. Similarly, 1 over j, you can see I've simply inverted the modulus. I've written 1 over root 2, change the sign of the phase, argument minus 45. Similarly over here, 1 over root 2, arg minus pi by 4. For the other one, 1 minus j root 3, you can see the gain is 2, the phase minus 60. Or in radians, 2 arg minus pi by 3. And if I inverse it, you see I can write 0.5 arg 60 or 0.5 arg pi by 3. And so all we're showing on this page is the compact representation of the gain and phase information. And that will be useful in the videos to come. So some conclusions. We've given quick revision of the definitions of modulus and argument for a complex number. We've demonstrated that the gain of the inverse of z is the inverse of the gain of z. The modulus of the conjugate of z is the same as the modulus of z. Now, I'm being naughty here. I'm reminding you, same time, that you can use gain and modulus almost interchangeably. We've demonstrated that the phase of the inverse of z is minus the phase of z. And similarly, the phase or argument of the conjugate of z is minus the argument of z.